Hey guys, welcome to our very first of many videos where we'll be interviewing different CEOs, entrepreneurs, and business owners of small and big businesses so that they can share their life story, their strategies, and techniques that you too can apply to your business, whether it's small or big. So be sure to subscribe to this channel, like that video, and hit the bell for more videos like this. Come on, come on. Gotta stretch. <laughs> okay. The auto industry has become one of the most difficult and competitive markets as buying a vehicle has become an option due to companies like Uber and Lyft and the world growing concern to carbon emissions, it has become more difficult to sell a gas powered vehicle. Carlos, the owner of Imports and Classics, buys and sells variety of vehicles, but they pride themselves in the Collector Classics. Carlos and his team has been featured on the Discovery Channel in 2017, so this is not your typical auto shop. All right, so let's go meet Carlos. So this is Carlos, the owner of Imports and Classics. Carlos, it's awesome to have you on our video. And don't worry, we're not gonna have, ask you any personal questions like how much money you make, man. Yeah, just enough to get by. <laughs> so what is the most valuable investment that you've made? I feel like everybody at some point in their lives, they have, a, they have kind of like a, a defining moment. It sends you in a certain direction and then it opens doors. And I feel like, I feel like everybody at some point needs to make a decision and, and it can happen at a young age. It can happen at 15, 16, it can happen at 18, 20 or it can even happen at 50 years old but at some point in everybody's life something happens and they have to make a decision that's going to change the direction that they're going to go i grew up in single and double wide trailers to the day i graduated high school and my, my parents we did not come for money right i appreciate the most about my parents is they didn't have much instead of saying hey here it is because you wanted it they say how are you going to get it and so I would trade, I would, be, I would trade Pokemon cards, I would, I would find a way to, to get what it is that I wanted uh, through bartering and thinking about it and coming up with a plan, you know, and getting there. And I feel like that was kind of one of the, 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 the things that, that, that molded me into who I am. And I was selling berries on the side of the road from fifth grade to high school, and then I saved up enough money to buy a car, and I, and I worked really hard for my money, so I wanted to make sure that I spent it right. My parents lost their house in 2009 to foreclosure, but they made too much money on paper for me to get financial aid. So I was in a position where I wanted to go to college for business, but I couldn't afford it myself because I didn't do good enough to get a scholarship. But then my parents, they couldn't pay for it either because they were in the middle of losing their house. And I was just in this situation where all of my friends are taken off to college and where does that leave me? And I'm not saying anything bad about college, but I personally didn't have to go to college to educate myself about a business that I wanted to start. That was one of those defining moments where I'm like, am I gonna go to college or not? No, I didn't go to college, I started a business. What is your most valuable card swipe that you've ever did? I bought my house when I was 22 years old. I mean, it was $130,000, it was a teardown. The house was falling apart, and I walked in there, it was all I could afford, and I bought it, I remodeled it, I made $250,000 in equity uh, in the span of a year and a half and I worked on it every single day. I pulled $175,000 equity, put it right back into the business, and I used that to grow my inventory. Once I had that equity, I drew attention, and I ended up getting a TV show on Discovery Channel. So talk more about your TV channel. I remember I got, a, I got an email from a, from a production company, and it was a, it was a casting call for a, for a TV series on, on a major cable network, is what they said. And I saw a phone number, and I called, and somebody answered started a conversation with them and they, they had found my company online because uh, I had a very good online presence as far as marketing classic cars all over the world mm -hmm. and, and the country. I'd market on, on, you know, in Miami, New York, LA, Vegas, I had big cities and I would market local vehicles that I took on consignment on commission and then I would sell them all over the country on commission, 8%. Now that business model makes sense because I didn't put out any money, but I would make 8% on a $40,000 car for three cars a month. So now it just comes down to using your skills. Camera, passion for cars, knowledge for cars, and marketing. I just leveraged my skills to, to, to pay my bills because I didn't actually have the money, right? But doing that drew attention 
because they saw that I was marketing beautiful classic cars. And uh, when they got on the phone with me, I was 24 years old at the time. And they're like, well, you're the you're a 24 year old Hispanic guy in an 18,000 square foot building flipping classic cars all over the world. They're like, okay, you got that our attention, great. right? That sounds <laughs> But unfortunately the show, that wasn't what they were looking for. They were looking to restore. Yeah, and I never really ran uh, a restoration shop. I, I, I just bought and sold classic cars. If somebody offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not sure you can do it, say yes and then figure out how to do it later. And so when they asked me, they're like, can you restore cars? I looked around a little bit and I said, yeah, 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 yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah, definitely, we can make that happen. Immediately after that, I woke up at five in the morning every day to get to Starbucks by 6 a.m. because it was 9 a.m. in New York and I was working trade deals and contracts and details to create a TV show. Right, so I worked for eight months for free with no pay to get a TV show. We ended up selling a, a, a six episode series to the world's biggest cable network about a shop that didn't even exist. We ended up booking out the shop, calls from all over the world, people sending cars from Argentina or buying cars here, shipping them to us to ship them to Argentina. I mean, we, we are globally, we got calls from everywhere and um, it just completely changed the company forever. But yeah, the show happened and it put us on the map and then now I had all this extra money and this revenue and what I did is like, well, what do I do? Classic Cars was passionate, it's great content, it got us a TV show and it paid us. But the car dealership is what's gonna make us money and so you had to, I had to see that opportunity, right? And move on it at the right time. The TV show is gone, what do we do now? Start a car dealership, right? And, uh, and so we've, yeah, we've sold hundreds of cars, we've never had a negative review. I can honestly say there's nobody around here that can say, they'll look you in the face and say that I screwed them over. And that's coming from a used car dealer. So forgive me for swearing, but my motto is don't f anybody over. Okay, so this is my, uh, my buddy's calling my circus truck. It's not that, it's a, it's actually called a, they call them jingle trucks. The reason they call them jingle trucks is because when you're driving down the road, oh, yeah. they make, they make noise. They have all these little, it was a gift from Pakistan to Canada for the BC World's Fair. Expo 86. It's a hand carved wood cab. The inside is, I mean, extremely over the top. Um, and it's just basically a, uh, a drivable art piece. I don't really know what I'm gonna do with it. I was thinking about taking it to Burning Man. The logistics of getting this thing down to the desert would be a little tough. This is the only one that I know of in the US or in North America alone. That right there is branding right there. You got some hand work right here. Dude, this thing is a beauty. Give me the genesis of Carlos and the, 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 the auto shop and the dealer station. Like, how did that begin? Like, I mean, I was always been in cars. I've been in cars since I was like yeah, 15, like yeah. 14 years old. When it came down to it, man, I had to save up money to buy my first car, right? And if I was going to buy my first car, I wanted to make sure I got a good deal. Yeah. And if I got a good deal, chances it was that something I could make a profit off of. And that's, that's what happened. I bought my first car, drove it for a while, and I made a profit. And I'm like, hey, I kind of know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I started going to the auctions. And then I started, you know, I started buying cars at the auction. And then... Next thing you know, I was I started getting into collector cars and I started shipping classic cars over to Europe. Wow. So the idea of a dealership, has that ever scared you? Like having this uh, dealership this size? You know what's funny, man, is I grew, I grew up around here and I remember driving by this exact dealership that we're in and seeing it full of cars. And I used to wonder, what would it take to run a place like that? And here we are, you know, 10 years later, running a place in the exact same spot that we were. How many hours a week have you invested into this business when it just started? And how many hours do you invest now? I wouldn't say that I, uh, I ever tracked my hours. Because if you're going to be a business owner, you can't track your time. There's no such thing as logging hours for yourself in a business. I, think, I feel like anybody who logs their own hours in their own, own business is setting themselves up to fail. Because the reason you're starting a business is because it's something that you're passionate about and you, want, and you, and you would be doing it for free. <laughs> if I had to say the uh, amount of hours that I put in in the beginning, I would say it was from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. All day, every day, I was sticking to what I like to do. And in the beginning, it was really, really passionate. I, was, I had a very, very good business model. And sometimes I, wanna, I wish that I could go back to that because it was so simple. I would, I would basically just buy classic car projects, rusty, beat up shells, and I would sell them to Europe and all over the country. And it was actually a really good model. I was flipping them out of my mom's driveway. Um, I would buy a rusty two-door Bel Air post out of somebody out of the blackberry bushes of somebody next to somebody's barn, and I would get a tow to my mom's driveway. I would pressure wash it. I would put air in the tires. I'd make sure that it could roll, and then I'd market it on online forums in Europe and all over the country, and I'd ship them out for fifteen hundred bucks profit. I feel that was pretty fair. I'd buy a car for a thousand bucks tow it for 300 bucks, sell it for just under three, and I'd make a little margin, right? Do that for two to three cars a month. 
how many hours are they really putting in? So when I, when I was 18, 19, I was making about three to $6,000 a month average with no overhead, which wasn't bad. I mean, for a 19 year old, I mean, like I, I had no bills. I was living with my parents and I, I thought I had it made because I, I made my own schedule and I was making just as much as most of my buddies, you know, but I was, I was doing something that I loved. <laughs> All right, let me let me just show you guys around here if you guys want to take a look. My mom actually works for me, so this is her desk, and she met <laughs> my mom. Yeah, yeah, my mom works for me. Yeah, no, it's it's actually really cool to be working with family. You know, it's um uh, we we got a really tight crew here. So this is this is kind of an example of what we do. Um, we'll take cars down to absolutely nothing and then put them back together. So. So how much do you charge for a paint like paint job like this? Our average paint jobs in house, depending on the body work, can range from. Uh, a, a standard paint job of you know eight thousand dollars to uh, a full rotisserie build, which could be upwards of forty thousand. So we've had some builds that were one hundred twenty thousand dollars, but about seventy thousand of it was just the parts. You, it's really easy to throw a lot, throw a lot of money at a dream car. Yes, it is. And this is the this is the passionate side of the business. is one of my favorite parts. It's actually the part of the business that I deal with mostly uh, day to day. It is, I believe, it's a fifty six team, fifty five to fifty seven. I think it's a fifty six. A uh, client brought it in, it was sitting for 25 years. We gave it a quick buff, we woke it up for him. Um, he didn't know where to start, right? Old gas, bad carburetor, brought it in and uh, brought it back to life. Some of these cars will sit for 30 or 40 years and then we'll restore them and I hope that they're on the road for another 30 or 40 years and they're passed down and kept in people's garages and yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of what I hope would happen with every single build that comes out of the shop. The value in the end when it's finished is not gonna be what you invested unless it's the right car. And that's what brings me to my next point. That being said, these Volkswagens, for example, it's gonna take the same amount of money to restore one of these, but the final value on one of these is gonna be, you can make a profit. You can make $50,000 on restoring the right car with the same amount of money versus restoring the wrong car. And that, that's, part, that's part of the game. So I, I, we've, we've, we've done work on cars that I bought myself, that I bought for $10,000 and I threw $15,000 into, and I sold for 50. And there's been times where I've bought cars, uh, where clients have brought cars to me that I know restored are worth 30, but they had to put 30 into it just to save it. So we build it for them, that's, that's our job. So if I were to open up a dealership across the street, I'd call it Deport and Fantastic. <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> would you do something about it? Would you hire the mafia to make it look like a gas leak? Dude, you, you, know, you know what? I'm actually, I'm on really, really good terms with all the local car dealers. I know them all, everybody knows. It, when I first got into the business, uh, some of the car dealers were a little salty, but once you start get to, when you meet people in person and I meet new car dealers locally, I actually, I, I welcome them. You know, like, like, you can't hate on competition. I'm gonna have my business and I'm gonna run it well. And if somebody else is gonna run the same business, I'm just gonna work harder than them. I don't, I, I don't hate my competition, I don't fear my competition. If somebody's set up across the street, well, it's because it's a great location. Give our viewers five steps to successfully open up a successful dealership. First step, get a business license. Okay. Once you have the business license, open up a business bank account. In order to get that bank account, you need to give them a UBI number that comes with your business license. That's usually like the tax ID number. Find a location, buy inventory. What's the process of buying the inventory? Why, why do you have to be careful about what you buy? So my model is a little bit different because it's all about my location, okay? So like whoever, whoever watches this and if you're located in Texas or, or some other part of the country, your, your target demographic is gonna be completely different than mine. Up here, there's Subarus that are selling because we're the Pacific Northwest. We have snow, we have seasonal climate that, that you need a four cylinder all wheel drive to, to get through. So Subaru's so well up here but then they're cheaper in Arizona. Not really popular in Texas, but the trucks are popular in Texas, but the trucks are popular up here. It's all relative to where you live. Um, so us being located in the top Northwest corner of the country, my model is very unique in the sense that I import cars from Canada. And so a lot of my inventory I'll import down from Canada and I'll, I'll spend, I'll spend $300,000 a week in Canada and I won't see that inventory for 35 days. I have to buy it. Right. It has to be brought across the border legally with a uh, 7501 stamped at US Customs. It has to sit in a federal holding lot for 30 days. 
and then, and then it can be released to be sold. There was a lot of people that were buying cars and flooding the US market with gray market vehicles from out of country. And the reason for that is because the Canadian dollar is around, give or take 76 cents, 75 cents to the US dollar right now. So you spend $40,000 in Canada, you're spending 30,000 US. The vehicle books for high 30s US, after import and everything, you'll have a margin. So my model right now, it's gonna change. I know it's not gonna last forever, but we're cashing out on it right now, is we're buying late model SUVs and trucks from Canada, and I'm spending spending 70,000 Canadian per car and I'm importing down and I'm marking up, but I'm still undercutting every dealer in this country. Yeah, what's your margin? We like to move volume, right? Like if I can make 1500 bucks on a car, 2000 bucks on a car, the state makes more than me on that car. If I sell a $40,000 car and I make $2,000 on it, the state gets $3,500, $3,600 in taxes. So the state makes more than us, but they're not paying the power bill. They're not paying the, the mortgage. Uh, my, my goal is to get, I, I want to get to about 60, 70 cars a month. And that's not a massive dealership, but it's, uh, it's still a decent size. Right. Um, and if I can get to 60 cars a month, at a couple thousand profit each, and we introduce some back-end products like, I mean, that's nothing to have, that's not a conversation to have right now because if somebody's just getting into the business, they're not, they're not gonna be selling back-end products like gap insurance and extended warranties and all that. You can make a lot of money selling that. We don't really push that kind of stuff because we're pretty new to it, but uh, a lot of dealerships will make a lot of money on their insurance, their warranties, and that kind of stuff. I really like it, and if anybody wants to get in, involved in the business, I just say just do your research and, and watch videos like this. And All right, well, Carlos, thank you so much for sharing with us all this content. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please comment on the bottom. Let us know. So thanks so much, man. Thanks, brother. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions for Carlos, go on importsandclassics.com. In this segment, we wanted to ask several questions to our viewers. So what is stopping you from starting a business? What is the biggest stereotype of being a business owner that you have or that somebody that you know has about you? Also, what business do you want us to showcase in our next videos? And what question do you want us to ask our guests? So comment on the bottom, like this video, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.